John Olorun Femi Onayekon was born on the 29th of January 1944. He is a Nigerian prelate of the Roman Catholic Church. He was Archbishop of Abuja from 1994 to 2019 and was created a cardinal in 2012. He has served as president of the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, president of the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria and Bishop of Ilorin. Today, he is our guest on the one-on-one -on -one show. Your Eminence, thank you for having Plus TV Africa on a very, very short notice and giving us the time out of your very, very busy schedule. Nigerians were shocked to hear of the news of your resignation or retirement. Can you clear the air on that? I'm surprised to hear that Nigerians are shocked that a 75-year-old man should be asking to retire. I thought it would be so expected because I don't know, uh, apart from presidents who can still aspire to rule at the age of 80 and 90, most people, um, civil servants, they retire at 60. Uh, even uh, professors, 65, 70, judges, hardly anybody hangs on until 75 before retirement. Uh, and our church, therefore, uh, has a rule that bishops uh, uh, should be prepared to retire at the age of 75. And I just followed the rule. Uh, since every Catholic, at least any enlightened Catholic knows this rule. Nobody should say they are surprised. And if anybody is to be surprised, certainly not the Catholics of Abuja Archdiocese, since for the past five years I have been singing about this, looking forward to my retirement at the age of 75. And then um, since, uh, since I turned 75, it became very clear that the, the, the end is fast approaching, and according to our laws, I sent a letter to, the, to His Holiness, the Pope, telling him, I have now clocked 75, and I'm requesting to be allowed to go on retirement. According to our laws, you don't just retire when you are 75 on your own. You have to ask to be released, and the Pope will take his time to answer you. Some people in Abuja were, were hoping that the Pope will take his time. I would not uh, reply to me uh, until another year or two, like is happening in some other places. But I personally made a very passionate plea to, this, to His Holiness not to delay my retirement. And then <clears throat> the fact that in March he then appointed my successor was for me a good sign. Because in, in March the Pope appointed the former Archbishop of Jos, as the co-adjutor Archbishop of Abuja, which means he was already he was appointed to be my successor whenever eventually I retire. Generally, according to our church arrangement, once you have a co-adjutor and you are already over 70-75, it's a clear sign that your, um, your term of office is uh, coming to an end. So you can see therefore that those who know the church law and who know me and who are involved, who are working with us, it was not a surprise to them mm. that I was retiring. I noticed that my friends out, out there who are not Catholics uh, felt a bit of a disappointment that I am, as it were, according to them, moving out of center stage. Uh, the fact is that nobody can be in center stage forever. And uh, you do your work, you try your best for as long as God keeps, gives you life. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the, my retirement actually does not mean that I no longer have anything to say. In fact, on the contrary, I have more time now to, to uh, get involved in many things which bureaucratic... Uh, 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 the bureaucratic affairs of running a archdiocese would, did not give me sufficient time to do. You see, uh, retirement from the position of archbishop means um, that I am no longer in charge of the archdiocese. 
and uh, the bus no longer stops with me. And anybody, uh, both the, uh, uh, both the uh, administrative as well as the financial running of the archdiocese, have I now hand over to someone else, just like I received it from someone else. And we do it in a very smooth and uh, in a very smooth way. No rancor, no uh, no anger, no complaint, no tribunals <laughs> to say no, I didn't, I shouldn't take over. No, I should take over. Everything was just straightforward and simple. Those who were in the church on December fifth at our new cathedral in Kasana Kubwa will see how everything was done very smoothly and even very ceremoniously and uh, very solemnly. It was moving, all right. Even for me, it was moving because I have been uh, Archbishop of Abuja for 25 years, Bishop of Abuja for about four more years earlier on before I became Archbishop. I've been used to be uh, Abuja Archdiocese, Catholic Archdiocese equals Anayiko, Anayiko equals Catholic Archdiocese. But I have been preparing myself for the transition from being in charge to uh, being available to help whoever, to help my uh, successor, whom I, know, whom I know very well, with whom we have been working as members of the same Bishops Conference of Nigeria. I used to be the president of the conference. He too used to be president of conference. So we have had the same similar experiences. He has had to deal a lot with um, Christian Muslim uh, difficulties up in Jos. I have taken it upon myself here too to do all I can to promote Christian Muslim understanding at highest level possible. So we have common interests and common experiences. Nigerians will not be quick to forget uh, that the Catholic Church has suffered tremendously from the Boko Haram terrorist group. We'll not forget Joss, Madala in Ninja State, even Abuja, and other states in the north. Do you think we're making progress in the war against terror? I think by now, we should be able to, uh, to think of Boko Haram outside of Christian Muslim. Of course, at the beginning, the impression that we got was that Boko Haram was targeting Christians, especially when they came out openly making, they were very good at, they are very good at making careless statements. When they came out with statements to the effect that every Nigerian must become a Muslim, well, of course they can say that, but we know very well they can't do it. Uh -huh. So because of that, we felt that they were targeting us Christians. Maybe they did too, you mentioned, you, made a few, you mentioned a few places. But the fact remains that right from the beginning, we were not the only ones, not only Christians were suffering from Boko Haram, and not only Catholics were suffering from Boko Haram, other, even Muslims too, were target to Boko Haram attacks. Today it is clear and obvious. After all, you mentioned the billions that the government has budgeted to uh, engage Boko Haram. And every now and again, we hear it announced that they have, uh, they have attacked and they have, um, Boko Haram has killed so many soldiers, so many soldiers have killed so many Boko Haram. They are not talking about Muslim and Christian, no. Much, many of the commanders who are fighting Boko Haram are Muslims. So we, now, we must have to realize now that when you are talking of terrorism, we have to uh, we have to go beyond religion, and if we invoke religion at all, we are then talking of the worst aspect of religion, namely those who, in the name of religion, go around uh, killing people, thinking that that's the best way to do honor to God. Now, uh, for a long time, the Muslim world tried to go in denial about the fact that this terrorism whether Boko Haram in Nigeria or ISIS in, uh, 
in the Middle East, whether they are Muslim. They say, no, they are not Muslims. Many of my friends, Muslim friends, when we first talked, we were talking about Boko Haram, they said, no, they are not Muslims. How can a Muslim kill innocent people? That's what they say. And I kept telling them, I said, sorry, my brother. Uh, we are not saying that uh, uh, they are killing people for your sake because of you. We are, but as, they are saying that they are Muslims. They keep saying that they are Muslims. So you must first of all admit that these people who are doing this call themselves Muslims. And therefore, you have to deal with them, with your own people. It is you, Muslims, who can talk to Boko Haram. Me, as a cardinal, archbishop, Catholic, what can I talk? How can I talk to them? I don't even know their language. So eventually, I must say, uh, Muslims, not only in Nigeria, but the world over, have taken this matter very seriously. I remember at a big meeting we had somewhere in Europe, and there was this gentleman, very good, very well-known friend of mine, from Lebanon, who was a Muslim. And he was talking to fellow Muslims. I said, listen, my brother Muslims, there's no point going on saying that this People are not our men because nobody believes us anymore. People are saying that it is we who are doing what they are doing. So what we need to do now is how do we tackle them? How do we tell them? And that is why all over the world there has been a great movement on the part of Muslims to try all they can to change the heart and mind of those who are Islamic um, uh, terrorists and telling them precisely uh, on the basis of the Quran of, uh, the, uh, of the teachings of Islam that what they are doing is wrong. To some extent they are succeeding but as you know even when you're talking of Boko Haram and all that all their exploits in Nigeria uh, the, uh, the international Muslim terrorist groups have done more harm to Muslim nations than they have done to Nigeria. They practically destroyed, practically destroyed Iraq and Syria. Uh, and uh, even now, what is left of, uh, of Libya is something that is very, very painful. Uh, so um, I think it's, it would be helpful for us, especially in Nigeria, to admit that Boko Haram is a terrorist organization, if you like, call them political criminals, whom all men and women of goodwill must join hands to, uh, to deal with and eliminate from our midst. If we do not take it that way, then we will not be able to work together. Uh, it is not something you can even leave to Muslims alone. But the Muslims must admit, and we will help them as far as we can, we who are not Muslims, and we work we, together, we work as, Chris, as Nigerians to rid our country of this bad, uh, bad poison, which is what the terrorism is all about. In terms of national integration, how well do you think the present government has performed? Sooner or later, people will begin to accept where they have done wrong and uh, begin to behave better, begin to behave better. Look at what is happening in the National Assembly. Of recent, there's a major discussion about the famous uh, constituency uh, uh, votes, big, uh, big monies that the politicians want to control, uh, the, the members of the House want to control as uh, part of their duties. You know, he wants to have so many millions or billions to do certain things within their, their constituency. And we are asking ourselves, is that what you, they, were, um, uh, they were elected to do? You are elected to pass laws, to, to uh, put the executive on tiptoe. If you need water in your, if you need good road in your constituency, Yes, just, you are not supposed to turn yourself into a, into a contractor to do the road. You are supposed to legislate within the uh, assembly so that the Federal Ministry of Works will uh, include this in its work and get the job done. Now, but we have gradually forgot, uh, turned away from that. Nobody, we, 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 
And it seems that uh, everybody wants to have the, a chunk of the, of the national cake. And when you ask at the end of the day, it is simply boys that too. just want to make money. And what do people do with all the money they are making? We don't know. Some of them have made so much money they don't know what to do with it. They stash them all abroad, buy useless buildings, throw them in banks where if anything should happen to them, nobody can get our money back. We are still looking for the money stolen by Abacha and his friends. And after Abacha, there are many others who have been stealing money, even as we are talking. That, that's not the way for a country to progress. It is a shame. And the younger generation uh, being left almost in despair. I'd like to know your take on the hate speech bill and even the attempt to regulate social media by the federal government. The lawmakers are prescribing death penalty for hate speech. Do you think that is the right way to go? First of all, I am totally against uh, death penalty for anything, whether for kidnapping, even for killing. For murder, I do not. I do not. Uh, uh, I always oppose death penalty because it is no. That is not a way to achieve justice. That apart. So when once I say that, it means that I obviously cannot support death penalty for whatever the National Assembly may be talking about hate speech. But to come come down to your question, it is not clear what they actually mean by hate speech. Even if the penalty is going to be imprisonment, three years, four years, five years, we want to know what, do you do, what is it that you do that is then categorized as hate speech? Who determines when what I say is hate speech? Uh, the, we, the, if, you, if you hear so much uh, um, rancor over this whole issue, it is simply because people have realized that it appears that some people out there in government want to uh, want to carry on in a way that nobody will dare to say anything they don't want to hear. Because at the end of the day, hate speech means you are saying something I don't want to hear. And I call it hate speech. From our experience, it's true that hate speech has caused a lot of havoc. Hate speech has led to, to um, uh, pogroms and uh, genocides. Hate speech led to the um, the killing of millions of Jews in Nazi, uh, Nazi Germany. His speech led to a lot of killing in Rwanda, uh, in which uh, Tutsis were killed, in, Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed in large numbers. But we should not forget that those cases is generally government agencies that were responsible for the hate speech, not opposition or other people. It is when the government begins, begins to uh, peddle hate speech, then they succeed in uh, convincing the, who, the youth media like you people to turn certain groups of people into non-human beings who deserve to get the worst of treatment. And when that happened, when the Nazi government in Germany turned against the Jews and turned them into, said that they are the worst people in the world, and even the ordinary people, good people, were carried along by that hate speech. Ditto in Rwanda. And if we are not careful in Nigeria, the way our government is going, they could end up in a situation where the government has can begin to peddle some ideas about certain people in such a way that they make them into uh, those who are liable to be uh, simply eliminated by the nation because they are considered bad people. Um, I suspect all this question about his speech is not unconnected with the um, bad blood that certain segments of the Nigerian community has, has more or less um, has generated by, for itself through a lot of its action. 
let me make a, a sort of a, my suspicion. You know, uh, there was it as you see we do with at a time when Fulani headsmen were found everywhere. There was killing. You go round and it's the same, the same name, Fulani headsmen. And I kept saying, this must be stopped because you reach a stage where Fulani headsmen will no longer have any place they can freely move around in Nigeria because people will hate them. Now, maybe somebody wants to pass a law whereby we can no longer talk about Fulani headsmen. If you talk about Fulani headsmen, you are accused of hate speech. And they say you can be killed. I'm only suspecting, because there are other people too who are given bad names. Come to think of it, those poor iPub boys who are, uh, have been uh, demonized at Biafras, not to talk of our friends, uh, our, the, 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 the Shiites. If you hear the way, at top level of government, they speak about the Shiites. They are told that they are all uh, X, Y, Z. Now, this is when hate speech is dangerous. When it comes from government, not when it comes from ordinary people. So what we probably need to do, what we need to do is, rather than talk so much about hate speech, let's talk about truth. Because you notice, the bill on hate speech does not say anything about whether what you say is true or false. And that is why it is left you, don't, you decide, it. who decides whether it is hate speech or not hate speech? Well, it's whatever you say, if it's whatever you say makes me hateful, then I say, no, we should talk about truth. We, we should live in, in a nation where people should be able to tell the truth. If anybody has done me something wrong, I should be able to say it frankly. Not afraid to say it, lest I will suffer uh, consequences that I don't deserve. Let us respect the truth all the time. Do you think it's possible to control social media? Because the federal government has insisted that they will control it. You can try, but you won't succeed now. Social media space can hardly be very difficult to control it through this, by legislation, not even by government uh, uh, scientific technical action. You know, all those, uh, all those uh, nations that are famous for controlling and, and um, social media. Uh, they do all they can, but social, social media refuse to be controlled. Somehow or the other, it comes out. But there was a time, of course, when government was totally in charge of all transmission of uh, electronic media. And anybody who started trying to transmit was immediately, there was no way of doing it secretly. You were targeted, you were found, and you could be uh, sent to jail. Today, it's not possible anymore. On your computer, you can start transmitting on the uh, internet. Even uh, China cannot stop it. Not to talk, USA cannot stop it. What they can do is pursue and uh, follow up the material that you are churning out. They've done that often, and they are sometimes able, if they are very, very very, very um, skillful, they may be able to trace certain uh, material to a particular person and catch him. But that is very, very difficult. You know, so when our, when our legislators say they want to control social media, I'm not sure how much they know about the internal dynamics and the technicalities of social media. They, if, they don't, if, if, they, if, if they knew, they would know that they can there is a limit to how far they can go. You, okay, tell people not to have, carry cell phones, not to, you, you, you um, there are some countries that try to block all uh, um, internet traffic. The trouble is that when you block internet traffic, you block it for yourself too. <laughs> so you must, you cannot block everything if you want the country, unless you want to ground the whole nation. Finally, if you say a word to Nigerians, what would that be? The word would be, we shouldn't give up. 
the country is not running as well as it should. And our present rulers don't seem to really not up to what they ought to be doing. But all, all hope is not lost. We can still do something to make our country a great nation. If we can reduce selfishness and uh, if we can reduce wickedness, if we can look at one another as just Nigerians and children of God, I think we can still uh, make it. Uh, uh, the way we are, we have normally have a chance every four years to assess our government and tell them to go ahead for another term if, we, if they are done well, or tell them to go aside and let some other people try if they done badly. My final word is, let Nigerians retain this right to choose who will rule them. And therefore, every time the elections are rigged, you are dealing a blow on the future of the nation. Why must our elections be always war? What's wrong with us? Simply to allow me to go and vote and say, this is the man I want to rule me, becomes Wahala. I can't. Or I go at, my, at the risk of my own life. And some people must win by all means. That is not democracy. And when a government says, we shall win, no matter what happens, which means they are prepared to do everything, not to allow the wishes of the people to be. Until we reach there, it will be very difficult to get where we ought to be. I don't know how we shall get there, whether, whether um, if we have a way of curbing the excesses of politicians, or if we have to rewrite all our rules, get an INEC that can be really independent and work for everybody, and beg Nigerians to allow peace to reign. But until that is done, it looks very, very, the situation is so sad that we are praying that we realize and change before it gets too bad. But like I said, I'm optimist. I think we, can, we shall make it. Because Nigerians are wonderful. You see how we are prepared, how we are performing abroad. We are wonderful. There's no reason why we should be the way we are now. Thank you for having us on Plus TV Africa. Thank you, Your Eminence.